So the moderator of the session will be uh, Jonathan Bagger. Okay. So. Okay, is uh, jo Jonathan Bagger, who is the chief executive officer of the American Physical Society, and therefore one of my many bosses, I believe, and he is going to moderate this uh, session on international uh, laboratory Directors. leaders, I guess. So thank you, Joel, and welcome to the afternoon session where we'll hear from the directors of the major world laboratories. But Joel asked me to say a few words first about the American Physical Society, and in particular about its international activities, which are so closely connected to the purpose of this conference. And so I start with the APS mission, which really since 1899 has been to advance and diffuse the knowledge of physics for the benefit of humanity. That is a huge mission and we do many things. So today I'm only gonna be focusing on part of it, our international activities. But I must say, I was just, I'm super happy to hear about the focus in this meeting about inclusion, about ethics, about values about behavior, because these are all parts of what it means to be a physicist today. And I'm so really happy to hear this being pushed in particular by the uh, early career scientists in the room. And so uh, kudos to you. I've also put on the screen uh, the APS values, which is how we do our science. And uh, I, uh, I inherited that list. I thought it was a little strange when I took this job, but actually those are pretty good values and they've come in uh, quite handy uh, during the last year and a half where I've been at APS. So we do a lot of things. We serve our community in many ways. But today, as I said, I was going to talk, I'm talking about international affairs and in particular about the priorities, some of our priorities in the areas of international affairs. So really, I would like to emphasize that we're here to strengthen scientist to scientist connections. How do we do that? Well, certainly we do it by hosting meetings. We have a, you know, these big general purpose meetings, the March meeting, the April meeting, but we also do it through unit meetings. For example, the DPF meeting or the, the division of nuclear physics meeting. And then very, from very specialized workshops too, like SNOMAS, all are part of ensuring communication and connection within the physics community. We also are working very hard on fostering communications as, as tensions are rising throughout the world, as borders are becoming higher. It is our job to ensure that physicists stay in touch with one another. So in particular, I'll talk in a minute about uh, a, 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 an initiative that's connecting US and Chinese scientists. Uh, and also a Global Physics Roundtable, which is connecting physics societies from around the world. But consistent with our values, we also speak out where it's necessary. And so the APS played a big role in getting the uh, Biden administration to reverse the so-called China Initiative, which really quite unjustly targeted uh, 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 scientists uh, of Ch uh, Chinese uh, origin in the United States, subjecting them to really some, some uh, 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 terrible injustices, in my opinion, uh, in the name of research security. And that initiative has been overturned through the work of APS and through the work of many people in this audience who contacted the US government. You of course spoke against the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, but we uh, also are, are committed to ensuring mobility and that means not canceling individual scientists, but speaking about out against actions of governments. And so we're really working to ensure, for example, that Ukrainian scientists who've been displaced have a play, can land on their feet, either in Europe or if necessary in the United States. And finally, under the category of ensuring mobility visas, I'll say a few words about that. 
in what follows, because at least I firmly believe that we are one international physics community and it is our job at APS to keep, those, uh, keep that going. So just to give you a, a, just a brief view of the APS, we have about 50,000 members, a quarter of them actually live outside the United States. In this pie chart, it's a bit hard to see, but essentially a third of them are from Europe, a third are from Asia, and a third are from everywhere else. About a third of the uh, 13,000 people who come to our March meeting actually uh, come from outside the United States as well. So really the APS, even though it has the word American in its title, doesn't have the word American in its mission. It is becoming an increasingly international organization. And also with the help of hybrid meetings and satellite meetings, we can actually go farther uh, into the world. For example, actually the March meeting had satellite meetings held in Rwanda, in South Africa, and in India, where physicists came together to participate virtually in those conferences. The most international part of APS are our journals in the sense that 86% of the papers that are published in our journals have a non-US author or co-author. So again, amazing statistics. So just wanted to highlight two activities, the US-China Roundtable, which was a, a opportunity for a group of high level uh, uh, scientists from the US and the China to get together to discuss uh, person to person some of the challenges they're facing with international collaboration between those two countries. Uh, this was uh, uh, sanctioned by the uh, US State Department that was very interested in learning uh, what we were able to learn about the obstacles that came from those scientist to scientist discussions. And also there's a global physics roundtable that uh, is being, uh, that started last year by the British Institute of Physics. We have the baton this year. Uh, that uh, roundtable produced a white paper on the role of physics in the green economy. And this year uh, we'll be taking a look at research security, trying to define the, ru the rules of the road for research collaboration. Our community knows how to do that. And so if we can't together as a global community come up with some rules of the road to give to our governments to say, hey, look, this is how it should work, nobody can. But we can't convene the global community if people can't get visas to come to the US. And so the APS certainly advocates for visa policies to enhance mobility. Our message is simple, very simple. It's that physics across the globe advances physics in the US and physics in the US advances physics across the globe because international collaboration advances physics worldwide. Of course, when we make the argument to the US government, we have to say what all the advantages are to the US. I'm not gonna go through this slide, but it does show some of the uh, uh, facts that actually are amazing about the contributions of the international community to American science. Uh, there's a report that you can download and take a look at, but as you can see, uh, 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 people who come to the US on visas make a huge difference to this country and reciprocally as well. So again, next in the coming year, we will be continuing these unit, these US-China discussions, uh, identifying some mutually beneficial joint projects and, and uh, using those as test cases to identify the uh, uh, issues that arise. We're going to continue the uh, Global Physics Roundtable uh, and consider establishing this group of physics societies from around the world, as in some sense, like the P20, come together and uh, talk about the challenges we're facing together, continue to advocate for scientific mobility. And for that, we need your help. If you're a US person, you saw those, some of those statistics, tell your congressperson why international mobility is in the interests of the US and actually in the interests of it all. So in the end, I'm just concluding by saying that really what we're trying to do is reinforce the role of the US as a, a welcoming hub for the global physics community, something that this meeting is demonstrating right off the uh, you know, first hand. And then I have one extra slide in case you do have visa issues, you, you have, we have lots of resources, but I'm not gonna talk about them now. Thank you. And And with that, I'm going to sit down and I will welcome the first laboratory director to uh, give her talk, Fabiola Ginetti.
Thank you. So thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss certain vision and, and, and plans for the years to come. And I'll try to summarize CERN in a few numbers in just one slide. Of course, I don't have the time to go through all of them, but I would like to draw your attention to a couple of numbers. So first of all, at each moment in time at CERN, we train something like 4,500 young people, including PhD students, postdoctoral fellows, trainees, technical students, etc. So there are excellent training opportunities for the young people in a leading uh, uh, lab, scientific lab, and a truly international environment. The second point is that the CERN population, the CERN community uh, consists of more than 16,000 people and more than 110 nationalities are represented. And here you can see the spectacular increase in the number of users at CERN as a function of time. Um, and in particular, the big jump with the advent of the Large Hadron Collider. You see in orange, the fraction of users coming from non-member states. And it increased from 25% at the lab time to uh, almost 40% today. And the US contributes more than 2,000 scientists from 142 institutions. 17% of the users actually come from the US. And this brings me to my initial remarks and to emphasizing that the contribution of DOE and SF and US scientists to uh, DLHC and CERN program more generally has been crucial to the success of, of the lab. In particular, I would like to acknowledge the intellectual contribution of the young scientists who participated in the R&D and construction and then physics analysis for the LHC. And, and those contributions will continue to be crucial also in the future for the high luminosity LHC and beyond. There is no way we can build a future collider at CERN, a post LHC collider, be it FCC or something else, without the strong participation of the US. And, and likewise, we are fully committed to the successful implementation of LBNF Dune, and of course, ready to discuss collaboration on other future projects in the US. So our scientific strategy and program are based on three pillars. Number one is the full exploitation of DLHC, so run three, which just started, and high luminosity DLHC, whose construction is underway. It will start in 2029 and end around 2042. Why I'm so vague? Because the goal is to deliver 3,000 inverse Ventoban to each of Atlas and CMS. And we think that we can do so by the beginning of the 2040s, 2041, 2, 2040, we don't know, but more or less at this, uh, in this um, uh, time span. The second pillar is what we call scientific diversity program. So the, the current experiments and, and facilities at the injectors, which uh, provide physics opportunities complementary to the LHC experiments. The neutrino platform is part of this scientific diversity program. And then the third pillar is the preparation of CERN future, which includes a vigorous accelerator R&D program, the feasibility study for, for FCC, and R&D and design studies for alternative scenarios, click and neon collider. So now I'm going to say a few words for each one of these, um, of these pillars. And I will start with the LHC. So as you know, a few days ago, we started run three at a record uh, collision energy, 13.6 TV. In run two, we achieved a peak luminosity, which is a factor of two larger than the design value, so two times 10 to the 34. And here you can see the spectacular uh, ramp up of the integrated luminosity over the years. So in run one and two, we have delivered almost uh, 200 inverse Ventoburn to the to Atlas and CMS. This is a lot, but it's actually only 6% of the total integrated luminosity expected at the end of high luminosity LHC. So really a huge, spectacular physics uh, program ahead um, with, the, um, uh, with the LHC. So uh, we are just out of long shutdown two, uh, LS2, during which we have upgraded the injectors to provide the beams of the intensity and brightness that are needed for the high luminosity LHC. We restarted them in 2021, and in some cases, here is one example for the booster, we have already achieved target performance. In LS3, we've been installing the upgrade of the collider of the LHC itself and the phase two upgrades of Atlas and CMS, and then LHCB and Alice also plan some uh, second round of major upgrades um, in, during long shutdown four. So the upgrade of the collider itself is not just an adiabatic uh, evolution because we are really upgrading 1.2 kilometer of machine, 
with uh, novel technologies from crab cavities to uh, superconducting links based on uh, HTS, high temperature superconductor, new collimators, crystal collimation, and also new uh, quadruples providing a field of 12 Tesla based on niobium tritine superconductor. So really a lot of new, uh, new stuff uh, there. Uh, the experiments, Atlas and CMS, are also undergoing uh, substantial upgrades to be able to maintain or even improve their performance during the high luminosity LHC in a, a much harsher environment, uh, because you know that the, the pileups or the number of simultaneous events per crossing will go up from an average of 30, 40 in run two to 140 to 200 in uh, during high luminosity LHC, and you can uh, you have a visual uh, view, I say, uh, of the of the of the challenge here. So the trackers will have to be replaced, and in the case of CMS, also the NCAP Carolinti. Uh, a few days ago, we celebrated 10 years from the Higgs discovery. Already 10 years, and I would like to spend one slide on, on the Higgs boson. So clearly, we know that uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson represented a monumental step forward in our understanding of fundamental physics. But this is really due to the fact that not only, of course, we have completed the standard model, but these discoveries has, um, has wide ranging uh, uh, implication. And this is because the, the Higgs boson is actually related to the most obscure and problematic sector of the standard model. If you look at the standard model Lagrangian, you see that the, the, the most profound structural question, so the origin of the flavor, the naturalness and hierarchy problem, the vacuum are really related to terms involving the Higgs boson. So the Higgs boson is clearly a, a very special tool and extra, an extraordinary discovery um, tool, which calls for a very broad uh, program extending for decades at LHC and, and beyond. And, no, and we should note that the Higgs boson can only be studied at collider. So when people say that the uh, collider era is over, this is just nonsense. So I try, I try to summarize here in this table, the current understanding of the um, X boson from the LHC. Huge progress has been made over the past 10 years. So I cannot go through all the numbers, but just highlight a few of them. So we have established at more than the five sigma level, all the production mode, low low fusion, vector boson fusion, et cetera. The couplings to the gauge boson were established already in run one and are measured today to six to 8%. The couplings to the third generation of fermions have been established in run two and they're measured to seven to 11 percent. We have evidence for the couplings to the second generation of fermions through a three sigma observation of X to mu mu. Um, the production of uh, the sensitivity to the, the uh, cross section for uh, two X production has achieved three times the standard model cross section. We have measured the mass to the one per, per mil level and so on and so forth. So at the high luminosity LHC, one of the highlights actually is, will be the first observation at the five sigma level combining Atlas and CMS of the production of two uh, X boson, which will give us access to the X potential in the standard model Lagrangian. So in particular, trilinear uh, coupling, which of course will tell us about the electroweak transition, phase transition in the early universe, et cetera. So moving to the second pillar, scientific diversity, uh, this exploits the unique capabilities of CERN injectors, um, which provide beams of different type of particles, uh, energies, time structure, intensity, et cetera. And these are exploited by some uh, 20 uh, projects to do physics, which is complementary to the collider from antimatter studies to axion searches to uh, rare the case, uh, et cetera. And also in these cases, we are looking now at the future of this program. We, can, we, will, we plan to continue this program in the next decades. So one example we plan, we are studying the possibility of upgrading the North area to higher intensity beams, reaching something like four times 10 to the 19 proton on target per year for slow extraction. And this kind of intensity will be very useful, for instance, for Kern physics, for beam dump experiment, exploring the dark sector, lepton flavor violation experiment, et cetera. The CERN neutrino platform is part of this scientific diversity program. And I remind you that it was established in 2014 following a recommendation of the previous strategy, which said that CERN should uh, uh, pave the way for a substantial European participation in long baseline experiments uh, in the US and in Japan. And so since then, the neutrino platform has provided space and, and beams 
for neutrino detectors. We have refurbished the Icarus detector for the short baseline project uh, program at Fermilab. And we, I mean, when I say we, I mean the, the international community uh, using CERN facility has built and operated two prototypes for Dune based on the single phase technology and the dual phase, which paved the way to the vertical drift technology. So today we are building two cryostats for LBNF Dune uh, based on this membrane uh, technology. We are on time for starting installation at Sanford in 2024. And we are now also building uh, two, uh, two, um, two module zero. Module zero, as you know, they are expected to um, uh, test components based on the final design. So they are the last word before final construction of the final detector start. So two modules zero, one for the thing, single phase, uh, so um, horizontal drift, and one for the verti vertical uh, drift. So the last five minutes to discuss preparation of the CERN future. So first of all, following uh, one of the uh, European strat strategy recommendation in 2020, the European community has developed two roadmaps, one for accelerator R&D and one for detector R&D, covering different technologies. Uh, and now we are in the implementation phase. So we are also putting in place the various organizational structure. And of course, US participation was important in the development of the roadmaps and will be important also uh, to, uh, in the future for the implementation of the, of the roadmap. I would like to stress that investment in R&D is absolutely essential for the future of the field is our lifeblood. So the second prong is the FCC feasibility study, which will be carried out uh, in the coming five years. If we started it in 2021, it will be completed in 2025 with a uh, feasibility study report. And it's based on several, on several recommendations of the European strategy, which says that, as you know, an electron positron X factory is the highest priority next collider. And for the longer term, Europe should have the ambition of operating a proton-proton collider at the highest achievable energy. Hence, the feasibility study of a 100 TV collider with an electron-positron Higgs and an electroweak factory as a possible first stage. And this study should be established as a global endeavor. So following this, we have established this study. So why did the European strategy identify FCC as the most promising future collider for CERN? And this is because, uh, the FCC is actually a facility with an immense physics potential because it can host any plus and minus collider running from the Z peak all the way to the top uh, TT bar uh, threshold. It can host a proton proton collider at the highest possible energy. It can provide lead, lead ion or ion ion collision, electron proton, electron ion collision. So the, the, really the, 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 the physics opportunities are immense. The feasibility study will focus on the first stage mach machine, FCC EE, and on the magnet R&D. We have allocated and secured important resources for this study, 40 million Swiss franc a year from CERN budget, 50-50 between the uh, FCC EE feasibility and the, and the magnet R&D, with additional funding coming from the European Commission and other collaborating uh, institutions. Timeline, uh, we are aiming at a project approval, if the approval will be granted, by the end of the decade, which will allow construction start at the end of 2030. So in principle, construction of SCC EE plus the tunnel take 10 years. So in principle, at the beginning of the 2040s, we should be able to operate SCC EE. However, as you have seen, high luminosity will only end in 2042. And so we need a few years to switch from a collider to the other one. So a more realistic schedule will be 2045 to 2048 for FCC EE operation. So here you can see the main objectives of the feasibility study. We are going to, uh, we have to demonstrate the geological, technical, administrative, environmental feasibility of the tunnel and the surface area. We will have to optimize the design of the colliders, the injectors, and of course, supported by the relevant uh, R&D uh, on the important technologies. Sustainability, of course, and environment are absolutely primary goals in uh, you know, demonstrating a, 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 for, for a future uh, facility. And we are going to consolidate the physics case and the detector uh, concept. Uh, this study will be carried out in a truly uh, international collaboration. 147 institutes are involved in the FCC study, sorry. 
um, from 34 countries and 12 from the US. There is plenty of opportunity for interesting work, new detector concept also for FCC, EE, accelerator technologies, and of course, the environmental impact is also very important. So more collaborators from the US will be absolutely welcome. Last minute to report about a recent major milestone. We have chosen the placement of the ring. We started with 50 initial variants, and then uh, based on the geology, on, on surface constraints in terms of land availability, access to roads, water, electricity, etc., we have found the best placement is 91.1 kilometer ring with eight surface point. And now the whole project is being adapted to this placement. In parallel, we are studying alternatives. So click the goal for the next update of the strategy is to produce a project res readiness report. At the moment, the click collaboration is working on improving power efficiency, optimizing the luminosity for the first stage machine. And muon colliders, as you know, this study is initially hosted uh, by CERN. We have put resources on it here. The goal is to work on the main challenges, which as you know, go from the muon source and cooling to neutrino background with the goal of determining by um, the time of the next European strategy, if investment in a test facility is justified from a scientific uh, perspective. I will skip environment and sustainability. We have been investing a lot of money at CERN uh, to um, you know, improve uh, our, the sustainability of our research infrastructure and uh, minimize our impact on the environment. And I will move to the conclusion. So CERN has a very compelling and broad scientific program along three prongs. The uh, DLHC is our flagship project. We'll be operating at the energy frontier until 2042. We have facility and experiments at the injector providing physics output, which is complementary to the collider. And we have a very intense R&D program and design studies for future facilities. The European strategy for particle physics has identified a future circular collider as the preferred option for a future post-LHC collider at CERN. It has an immense physics potential, but it's also challenging and ambitious project. But of course, we like the challenge. And uh, if you don't have challenges, it's not really, life becomes uh, boring. So the feasibility study has been launched. It will be completed in 2025. We have allocated substantial resources. The focus is on the first stage mach machine, FCC EE, and magnet R&D. And in parallel, we are exploring alternative options. I would like to, to emphasize that to maintain CERN as a leading lab in particle physics and to motivate the community, especially the young people, it's crucial to avoid a too long gap between the end of ILUMI in 2042 and the beginning of uh, the next, uh, um, a beginning of operation of the next facility. So just a few years, not more than that. Uh, also, it's very important to build this new facility in parallel to high luminosity LHC because this will give the young people the possibility to work on one end on data analysis for ILUMI and on the other end in parallel on R&D or construction of the new facility. And this, this is very much what people of my generation did at the time of LAP and LHC. I remember that it was very nice for me as a young postdoc to do data analysis at LAP and at the same time being able to work on detector development for LHC, new technologies, and then of course the construction of the LHC detector was probably the most enriching uh, uh, time in my uh, scientific life. I already stressed the very important recipro reciprocity between, uh, between the US and CERN, which I hope will continue also in the future. Let me conclude by saying that the future of the field is bright. There are so many uh, intriguing questions and fundamental questions in particle physics and so many nice opportunities to address them thanks to the great uh, advances in um, accelerator and detector uh, technologies. But of course, Global worldwide coordination and collaboration is of primary importance if you want to cover all of them. Thanks a lot.
Very good. Thank you so much for the invitation to talk about the vision and plans for Fermilab's next 10 to 20 years. So I would like to start from where Fabiola finished. Um, and I would like to begin with acknowledging that this is an exciting time for particle physics. There are profound science questions and immense discovery potential across all the five P5 drivers from the 2014 P5 report. And there have been significant advances in technology and in other enabling initiatives, drivers such as quantum, in some areas that were not even on the horizon in the 2014 uh, P5 exercise. And I would also like to say that this is a defining moment for Fermilab. With the successful completion of the LBNF in Dune, Fermilab will become the host of the first internationally conceived, constructed, and operated mega science experiment on US soil, and with that will be universally acknowledged as the world leader in neutrino science. And as we enter the next 50 years of the laboratory, our vision is that Fermilab remains America's premier particle physics and accelerator laboratory, delivering groundbreaking science and technology underpinned by a number of things, by a world-class and diverse workforce, by excellence in our laboratory operations, by a renewed and sustainable campus infrastructure integrated and supporting our science vision, and by strong and enduring regional, national, and international partnerships. So over the next decade, Fermilab plans to deliver a continuous stream of groundbreaking discovery, science, and technology innovation, just like the P5 report told us, that in this science will be addressing the 2014 P5 science drivers, but also any science priorities informed by this meeting and by the next P5 strategic planning exercise. And I have included some of the experiments that we will be carrying out in this decade. And we'll also successfully complete the 2014 P5 plan and begin its scientific exploitation consistent with the P5 timeline. And ENT will also become the host lab for Dune. And here you have, have enumerated the projects that we intend to complete. And in collaboration and coordination with the US community and with our international partners, we plan to ensure the success and impact of the next P5 strategic plan. And that will include the booster replacement, the completion of the Dune vision, and will also lay the groundwork for the next major facility on site ideally as an internationally conceived project, conceived and executed as a global endeavor. And we plan to pursue accelerator and detector R&D in support of all the previous initiatives, but also as sciences in their own right. And also we'll advance emerging science and technology capabilities with the ultimate goal that they further come back and enhance the laboratory's primary mission in high energy physics. And not only that, but Fermilab in this decade also aspires to diversify and empower our workforce by fostering a culture of respect, inclusion, transparency, and excellence and integrity because it is the right thing to do and because that's the only way to deliver groundbreaking science. And also plans to partner with regional and, uh, universities and also universities across the country. And in particular, including minority serving institutions in, in order to host a lot many more students on the Fermilab site 
as well as advanced degree programs and postdocs and faculty, joint faculty. And we aspire to achieve excellence in laboratory operations, renew our campus infrastructure with sustainability goals in mind and integrated with our science vision and forge strong regional, national and international partnerships in particular with the University of Chicago, Argon, URA and other institutions and also launch a strategic planning exercise of the future of Fermilab. What do we envision Fermilab to look like 20 years from now? So all of these, these plans are in fact captured in our laboratories, six strategic thrusts, which are our pillars of our vision of our new vision for Fermilab going forward. And I've included them for a reference. So how do these plans now map onto the SNOMAS frontiers? So starting with neutrino frontier, um, delivering LBNF and Dune in this decade is Fermilab's highest priority. And Dune will be the most capable neutrino experiment driven by LBNF and PIP2. And of course, we need to deliver PIP2 and, and the, the completion date is 2028. And we also need to deliver the far side, the near side of the LBNF Dune US project. And you see here the timeline, start of science with the Dune detectors in 2028, and then first beam from PIP2 on the Dune detectors starting at around 2031. And as the 2014 P5 report wrote, to complete the Dune vision, we also need to launch phase two, which includes upgrading the beam power, uh, the proton beam power to 2.4 megawatt and adding two more detectors in the far side, detector three and four, and also, of course, advancing high power targetry corresponding commensurate with 2.4 megawatt power. And so to deliver 2.4 megawatts from the accelerator complex, we need to replace the booster because this is the next bottleneck. And so we have a couple of different technical solutions for that. The ultimate uh, scenario is going to be informed by input from SNOMAS and P5. The two technical solutions include the NADEV LINAC directly being injected into the main injector from PIP2. The other is uh, we increase the PIP2 uh, energy to somewhere around 3 GV, 2 to 3 GV inject into a rapid cycling synchrotron and from there inject into the main injector. In either way, we also envision including a storage ring in either scenario, which will allow us to do experiments such as beam dark, dark, dark sector experiment and other outside will enable new capabilities beyond LBNF and Dune. And the uh, far detectors three and four, um, uh, uh, you see the, the uh, location here, and there is a workshop organized this fall uh, to study the module of opportunity, as is called. So the rough timeline there for, for neutrino science has um, uh, operations of NOVA uh, continuing, as well as the short baseline neutrino program, continuing all the way until the major long shutdown of the accelerator complex, which is required to connect uh, PIP2 into the main uh, uh, complex. Um, the construction of PIP2 until FY28 and operations ramp up the power from that point on. Construction of LBNF and Dune until FY31. Um, construction of Dune followed by operations, and then the booster replacement, which is presently in the R&D preconceptual phase, and, and then hopefully at some point here, construction is going to start. 
Moving on to collider science, our vision here is that Fermilab continues to be the leading US center for CMS and second leading in the world after CERN. CERN is of course our strong partner in so many ways and our most important partner. And the, our decadal goals in the collider uh, science area include maximizing science from LHC runs two and three and I'd like to remind you again that our remote operations center is back in operations at Fermilab, where you can sit and take shifts at the LHC, and we welcome you to do that. Execute the high luminosity LHC upgrades to the accelerator and CMS detector and advance R&D towards the FCC at CERN. You see the corresponding timelines here. Uh, Fabiola covered them already. And I added that, of course, we, we um, start to think about the future next generation facility on the Fermilab side beyond the completion of the Dune vision, um, starting with physics studies and preconceptual designs. Going on to the precision science, our vision here is that Fermilab is a world leader for accelerator-based charged lepton flavor violation and dark matter experiments. Our, the decadal goals in this area include completing data production and analysis, as well as theory, which go all hand in hand, for the mu G minus two experiment, which is presently in operation. And we expect this to be completed, the whole story uh, to, read, to achieve five sigma uh, sensitivity around FY25. And then of course, it's a challenge to think about ways to utilize this wonderful G minus two re ring that we'll have on the side. And then um, construct the mu 2 experiment and then uh, be able to run, uh, have some experimental runs. And, and then also continue to think about the upgrade of new to e to high power, 100 kilowatt, let's say, capability powered by PIP2, which is presently in the R&D phase. Um, uh, yes. On the cosmic frontier, our vision is that Fermilab is an essential partner to world leading science experiments uh, for dark matter, dark, dark energy and cosmic microwave background, as well as in laboratory experiments for the detection and study of properties of dark matter particles. Our decadal goals can be summarized in three categories. One is cosmic surveys, where we transition from DES to DESI and LSST, and you see the, the timelines. Cosmic microwave background, we, expect, we aspire to grow and apply our core capabilities by taking major roles in CMB stage four and dark matter detection consolidate around generation two action, um, including the beautiful ADMX experiment that I, I saw uh, at lunch today and the sub GV experiments. And on accelerator science and technology, we expect to stay world leading in advancing uh, the, the technology and the next generation particle accelerators uh, for the HEP as well as for the Office of Science and to be, to be an essential partner of choice for future large scale accelerators. Our decadal goals here include delivering 2.4 megawatt proton beam power to LBNF and Dune. And, and this includes some, uh, uh, the design and development of the booster replacement, as well as development of high power targetry capability. It's challenging and targeted effort needs to be uh, focused, effort needs to go into this area. And advancing R&D in high field magnets and superconducting RF for FCC at CERN and also for other future colliders and initiating physics studies and concepts towards a next major facility on Fermilab side, continuing to advance accelerator science, a science in its own right, and continue to enable the mission of the Office of Science. And here are a couple of examples of Fermilab R&D on magnets and SRF technology that are very much synergistic 
with the goals of FCC EE. This is world record 14.5 Tesla niobium 13 dipole magnet and uh, improvement of the uh, uh, high Q naught in SRF cavities at medium fields, which would be uh, 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 relevant for the uh, FCC frequencies. And in terms of emerging science and technology capabilities on QIS, our vision is that together with our partners, we become a major US quantum center in this decade, hosting national facilities for quantum science and developing innovative approaches that enable high energy physics uh, problems. And our major decadal goals are threefold to execute our national quantum center SQMS decadal roadmap that you see here. SQMS utilizes SRF technology to develop record coherence times on the order of two seconds has been demonstrated at Fermilab with the ultimate goal of developing a quantum computer that then can be used to solve complex problems in multiple fields. And in, in parallel, we're also working to advance quantum networks towards quantum internet. And we have a specific uh, a roadmap for how to get from regional uh, to metropolitan Chicago area and within the 10 years connect with Oak Ridge and also development of deep cryogenic electronics for scale up quantum computers. And AI machine learning, our goals are to um, uh, come up with powerful algorithms for the reconstruction simulation operations of our experiments also to, to um, uh, use real-time continuous learning control to run accelerators and even experimental facilities using those controls and then support the community's AI needs and AI on a chip. And since I'm running out of time on microelectronics, we, we would like together with our partners to host the major US microelectronic co-design center with the goals to develop microelectronics for extreme environments. Uh, we need to do that for dune detectors, uh, state-of-the-art integrated circuit, and uh, engage with industry on heterogeneous integration and advanced packaging uh, solutions. And so I'd like to conclude here with a few final thoughts. So particle physics is global indeed. And as Steve Rich told us at the beginning of this meeting, the evolving international context remains, remains essential for our field. In this decade, Fermilab will complete the 2014 P5 plan and will follow the next P5 plan. Dune phase one will be realized and phase two will be launched. And I would like to say that Fermilab's role for the HEP community as a whole is something that we take very seriously and it is an integral part of our mission at the laboratory. And the role extends as host to the US CMS and DUNE collaborations as the nexus for the US HEP and the broader SNOMAS frontier communities as a resource for large scale engineering, co-located expertise and capabilities and intellectual vitality. And finally, as an international user facility dedicated to a diverse workforce and collaborative culture and to enabling world-class scientific discovery. So thank you very much. And thank you for your contributions to defining the future of our field. Thank you very much, Leah. The uh, next speaker is Yifang Wang, who will be beaming in from Beijing.
Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Can you see my slides? Uh, now we can. Sorry, I made a mistake. Okay, uh, thanks very much for the invitation and uh, it's a great honor and uh, I'm very happy to give this uh, uh, presentations about the plan of uh, IHEP. So first of all, IHEP was built based on the Beijing Electron Positron Collider and the BES. Uh, the upgraded version of this machine det detector started in the year of 2009, and we plan to continue up to the year of 2030. We obtained already fruitful physics results with uh, typically say 70, 60 papers per year, and we believe that there are still uh, very rich physics programs requiring the more than 40 uh, English Fentabob data, which corresponding to about 15 years of data taking at the current luminosity. So we decided to have an upgrade, uh, which uh, has been approved by the Chinese Academy of Sciences and will be uh, completed in the year of 2024. Uh, the luminosity will be increased by factor of three and also the beam energy will be increased from 2.45 GV to 2.8 GV, so that we are able to work for the, uh, the charmed barrels. You see from this picture how the luminosity, luminosity is going to be increased and the red dots are the current reached uh, luminosity. For the diabetic experiment, uh, itself has been terminated on December 2020, and uh, detected decommissioning has been complete, completed. Uh, the data analysis is still in progress. We just reported a few months ago at Neutrino 2022, the latest uh, neutrino uh, oscillation uh, results, sine squared 2, theta 1, 3, with a precision of 2.8%. And we are going to uh, uh, further improve the results by uh, slightly uh, 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 another 0.2%, uh, hopefully next year, 2.6%. Uh, uh, you can see from this uh, picture that not only science square two theta one three, we got the best results in the world, but also that M32, uh, we have uh, 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 the best results uh, in the world. Uh, in the future, uh, we're actually uh, uh, building the 20 kiloton liquid scintillate detector at 53 kilometers baseline from reactor for neutrino mass hierarchy and, uh, uh, and also for the precision determination of oscillation parameters and also uh, astrophysics. So uh, uh, you can compare the uh, Juno detector with other experiments. The total mass has been a uh, factor of uh, at least a 20 larger than previous detectors with much better the energy resolution. With such an energy resolution, we can determine the neutrino mass hierarchy at the level of three sigma with six years of data taking with actual reactor power. With the uh, atmospheric neutrinos, we can get another one sigma. So in combined, uh, we can get something like four sigma from the Juno detector itself. Uh, we can also improve the neutrino the oscillation parameters by a large factor. You can see from this table, from current a few percent to the future a few, uh, a, a few per mirror level. And, uh, and also uh, the, uh, the experiment can have a very good sensitivity to solar neutrinos, supernova neutrinos, and also geoneutrinos. Uh, if there is a burst supernova neutrino, supernova happen, uh, we can have a very high statistics. And, uh, and also there is a high probability for us to discover the diffused supernova neutrinos. The construction status is now uh, in, uh, in uh, going on smoothly. Uh, components have been mostly produced, including the 20 inch uh, new type of MCP PMT, uh, 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 MCP PMTs. 
The steel structure has been completed. You can see from this uh, picture and the acrylic sphere uh, bonding has been in progress. The PMT installation will start in a few months and the liquid synthetic fitting will start next year. Uh, we believe that we can reach the 3% energy resolution and also clean, cleanness of uh, 10 to minus 17 gram per gram. Uh, we also plan to build a new detector to determine uh, very precisely the neutrino uh, energy spectrum from the reactor. Uh, it's about 30 meters from the, the reactor. This can serve as a reference neutrino spectrum for mass hierarchy determination. And also we can use this spectrum to look for star neutrinos and also provide the very precise nuclear data uh, for the uh, industry. Um, this detector has the highest possible energy resolution, roughly 1.5% over square E plus a constant term. Uh, this can be realized because we have been using large area silicon PM with uh, very high uh, detection efficiency, very high coverage, and of course, a very large volume, a uh, very large area. And uh, the total number of photoelectrons per MAV can reach 4,500. And, uh, and this is a factor of three uh, bigger than, uh, than the Juno. In order to perform the silicon PM, uh, 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 at this uh, kind of high requirement, we need to reduce uh, the uh, temperature to minus 50 degrees so as to reduce the dark noise by three orders of magnitude. And uh, for this purpose, we have to develop a new type of recipes for gadolinium working at this kind of low temperature. Uh, up to now, all the te technological uh, uh, R&D has been uh, completed and uh, we plan to complete all the construction by the end of next year. Uh, after the determination of the mass hierarchy, we believe that the Juno can uh, uh, work as a, new, uh, a zero neutrino double beta decay experiment. Uh, the goal is to really reach some kind of uh, uh, one milli EV uh, uh, effective double beta decay uh, uh, mass. If we are able to reach this level, you can see from this plot, we can basically determine the absolute neutrino mass to a level of uh, say five milli EV. This is comparison of all the future uh, double beta decay experiments. And really if we're able to load say 100 or 200 tellurium into the detector, uh, we can really reach uh, effective uh, double beta decay mass at the level of uh, say one to two uh, milli EV. So this is kind of uh, uh, idea we, we published in the year of 2017. Uh, let's move on to the cosmic rays. Uh, we just completed a construction of the large high altitude air shower detector. This is actually the world's largest one with electrons, muons, water Cherenkov detectors and, uh, and, uh, and the Cherenkov telescopes. Uh, the, uh, 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 with one year of data taking, we already obtained a lot of interesting results. For example, very high gamma rays from the Milky Way and also many high energy gamma ray sources from the Milky Way, which prove that there are many uh, pevatrons in the, in the Milky Way. And in the future, uh, we are going to have uh, or uh, publish the catalog of all the gamma rays in the, in the sky. And also we plan to build a large area of Cherenkov telescope at the same location. For the future uh, uh, space programs, uh, we have two experiments under the planning. Why is 3D crystal calorimeter to increase the acceptance by a factor of 10 and also increase the energy range by a factor of 10 to study the, uh, uh, to search for the dark matters and also to have a very pre precise cosmic ray spectrum measurement to calibrate the lasso detector on surface. And also this, this is a, a very good gamma ray, uh, uh, they can do a very good gamma ray survey. Uh, uh, the plan is to launch in the year of 2027. 
we are also planning another uh, X-ray satellite to measure the uh, timing and also polarization of X-ray rays in space. Uh, this can be used to study neutron stars, black holes, and so on using cutting edge technologies. This is again also uh, uh, a large international collaboration. Uh, the satellite is uh, is hopefully uh, being uh, launched in the year of uh, also 2027. Now let's move to the CPC as a Higgs factory. The idea came out in the year of 2012 and quickly gained the momentum in uh, our institute and also in the world. Uh, the idea is to have first the electron position colliders and looking for hints for new physics. Later on, the same terminal can be used for the proton proton collider. Uh, the baseline is uh, design of the, is the following we have a booster, then we have a collider ring, and uh, we have an injector. And the design luminosity at the uh, uh, 30 megawatt beam power is. Uh, five times 10 to 34. The baseline is 100 kilometers, 30 uh, megawatt, and upgradable to 50 megawatt, upgradable to high Lumi Z option, and also for TT bar. And, uh, and of course, the design has to be compatible with the future possible uh, PP collider. So uh, in the last uh, almost 10 years, we got a very strong support from the Ministry of Science Technology of China, the uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences and uh, also the National Science Foundation of China and the total funding of roughly, uh, uh, say, more than $40 million. Uh, the CDR has been completed and the TDR is going to be completed very soon and hopefully by end of this year. Uh, we uh, have been uh, uh, working on the key technology R&D in the last 10 years, for example, Super, superconducting RF cavities. And you can see from the right picture for the 650 megahertz cavity and also 1.3 gigahertz, uh, gigahertz cavity. Uh, the prototyping have all already exceeding the design specifications. And in a few cases, like for this one, 650 megahertz uh, 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 cavity, uh, we already reached a uh, very high performance, like 40 uh, megawatt per meter and uh, three times, almost three times uh, uh, 10 to the 10, the Q values. So, uh, and also we are working on high efficiency classrooms, plasma weak field accelerator for the injector, ion based high TC superconducting uh, technologies for the proton collider, and also many prototypes of magnets, vacuum pipes beam diagnostics, uh, polarized, polarized electron guns, and so on, and also detectors. Uh, you can see the right bottom picture. This is the world first ion-based superconducting coils. And uh, you can see the current and uh, had been reached roughly 100 amps for quite some time. Uh, for the detector, we have a new detector designs and also many detector technology r and the, the This new detector uh, concept has, uh, uh, in addition to the uh, standard uh, silicon uh, pixel vertex detector, we have a hybrid of silicon uh, strip uh, tracker uh, combined with uh, a, a gas detector for the particle ID and a better uh, tracking determination. Uh, for the electromagnetic calorimeter, we plan to use transverse uh, crystal bars to have a better electron energy resolution and also using a 2D readout with timing with 3D capabilities for the PFA. And for hydron calorimeter, we plan to use scintillator glass uh, uh, interleaved with a steel so that we can have a higher sampling ratio for better energy resolution. The idea schedule is the following. Uh, from now on until 2025, we are going to work on the TIC technologies, a complete the TDR, and uh, working on the site selection and try to build international collaboration and so on. In the idea case, we can get approval at the beginning of the 15th five years plan, which is starting from 2025. 
and uh, and hopefully we can start the construction then. So this picture shows the uh, the plan, and hopefully by the mid of twenty uh, thirties we can start the data taking to have Higgs, Z, and and the W and so on. So these are the list of the the, the timing. The project status is following. Uh, we are continuing the design and R and D effort uh, in the next uh, uh, few years. And we will de develop the uh, engineering design report for the government approval. We are going to strengthen the international collaborations and in particular with other Higgs factory proponents. We are actually now actively working with Chinese Academy of Sciences to prepare the proposal to the Ministry of Science Technology for the so-called Star China Initiated Large Science Project. And this idea of China Initiated Large Science Project has been there for more than five years, but not really moved ahead. So uh, now I think the government are actually working on this again, the idea and try to uh, realize this kind of initial idea. Uh, Cass and the most are actually actively working on this. Uh, another uh, rule uh, uh, working with the government is uh, is that uh, Chinese chemical sciences is organizing a new the world roadmap study, and we are going to come up with the executable plan for the future large science projects in the uh, in the fifteen to five years plan. So actually we are evaluating all the proposals based on science, technology, and feasibility. And uh, we, for the first time, build up uh, 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 an international advisory committee. And indeed, uh, many of you are sitting in the, in the audience. And, and also uh, we, we hope that we can finalize the report by mid 2023, the next year. And then uh, based on this report, we are going to approach to the National Committee for the Development of Reform, which is, which is actually uh, responsible for the funding of the five years plan. And of course, CAS is going to help us to negotiate with them. Uh, we, are, uh, we are going to continue to work on the uh, uh, international collaboration. Hopefully we can build uh, uh, international collaboration for the, uh, for the Higgs detector, for the Higgs uh, uh, factory. Uh, hopefully, we can start the civil construction in the next five years plan, which means 2025 to 2030. Of course, IHEP is engaged in many international projects like uh, Bell 2, Comet, and, uh, and uh, as CERN with the Hilume HC, with all the HC experiments, with Panda in, uh, in, uh, in FAIR, and also the dark side uh, uh, in uh, Grand Sasso. And with the US, we are members of EXO, and hopefully we can join EXO if it is approved. And uh, we are members of Gulang X, and also we are working with uh, the MS for its uh, uh, detector upgrade. Uh, there are a few number of uh, other projects at IHEP. The first one is the China Spallation Neutron Source, which is in uh, our Dongwa campus in the south of China, uh, not very far from Hong Kong. And uh, it is uh, uh, already operational since 2018 at a beam power of 100 kilowatt. Now the government is planned to upgrade this uh, spallation neutron source to 500 kilowatt with 10 more beams. Uh, it is more or less approved and we hope we can start the construction by end of this year. We are also discussing a possible new light source just next to the spallation neutron source, which could be started at the year of 2025. And uh, in Beijing, we are building a new light source called high energy photon source uh, in the north of Beijing. And, uh, and uh, hopefully it can be operational in the year of 2025. This is 6 GV, uh, uh, very good uh, emittance beam uh, with 100.3, 100, uh, uh, 1.3 uh, kilometer circumference and a very high uh, brightness. So these are all the plans of I have. Thank you.
So uh, thank you, Yifang. And the uh, final speaker of the uh, lab director session is Masa Yami Yamauchi from KEK. Thank you. <clears throat> is this or this one? This one is okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to talk about the uh, particle physics program in Japan and at KEK at this normal meeting. Yeah. It's normal meeting today. Okay, I hold it. It's better. Oh, I understand. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about the status of a particle physics program in Japan and at KEK at this normal meeting today. Uh, this is a quick summary of the, uh, of the physics program in Japan. <clears throat> uh, I was hoping to cover all these in some detail, but since my time is quite limited, let me uh, focus on these three topics today. Hyper Kamiokande, status of Super KEKB, and I spend half of my time to talk about International Linear Collider. Let me start from neutrino program. <clears throat> the T2K is a long baseline neutrino experiment using uh, JPARC as a neutrino source and the Super Kamiokande as a far detector at 300 kilometers downstream. Um, <clears throat> the Super Kamiokande is a big water Cherenkov detector constructed by Cosmic Ray Research Institute of University of Tokyo. And uh, this uh, uh, T2K collaboration consists of 470 members from 13 countries. It's an international collaboration. We have two very important outcomes so far. One is observation of new E appearance in new mu B. The other is that they observed a very interesting hint for CP violation in neutrino sector, <clears throat> or a difference between new mu to new E oscillation and new mu bar to new E bar oscillation and gave a constraint, the first constraint to the neutrino CP violation like this. We continue this experiment until 2026 and we move on to the next phase of the experiment using a hyper Kamiokande as a far detector. <clears throat> this hyper Kamiokande is a, a water Cherenkov detector of 190 kiloton, which is far bigger than previous uh, super Kamioka. And, uh, uh, a neutrino source, JPARC, we upgraded to 1.3 megawatt, which is done by KEK. <clears throat> this uh, project has been funded, approved uh, in 2020, and construction is now going on in full swing. <clears throat> um, and we plan to start the experiment in 2027. This is also an international collaboration consisting of 500 members from 20 countries. <clears throat> and KK's role in hypercomputer program is to uh, increase beam power from 0.5 megawatt to 1.3 megawatt. And we upgrade the near detector at 280 meters. And we construct a new intermediate water treatment detector together with the international neutrino physics community. And the upgrade of JPARC accelerator has two stages. At first stage, we replaced all the magnet power supplies to, uh, to increase the beam repetition rate by a factor of nearly two, which was done. And the beam commissioning is now being done. The operation will be expected in fall this year with 700, 750 kilowatt beam power. In the second stage, we will upgrade our system and all the upgrade will be done before 2026. 
and the beam lines for neutrino will be upgraded together with the international physics community. Oh, oops, sorry. Upgrade the horn, target, and so on. Everything will be done uh, before 2026. So from 2027, we start a new experiment with hyperfamil Kande, which has a order of magnitude better sensitivity to CP violation in the neutrino sector. Okay, uh, <clears throat> let me move on to the uh, status of uh, Super KKB, which is another flagship experiment at KK. This is an E plus E minus collider of uh, 10 GB uh, obstacle forest with an ambitious target luminosity, six times 10 to 35, which will allow us to collect 10 to 11 B meson, D meson, and so on. And the very two collaboration consists of 1,100 physicists from 26 uh, countries. The achieved luminosity so far is 4.7 times 10 to 34, which is a good number, but still factor of 13, less than the design value. The most important parameter in uh, <coughs> super KQB is uh, luminosity. This compares the two collision scheme between old KKB and current super KKB. And uh, in upgraded KK super KKB, beam E plus and E minus collider is much larger, four times larger crossing angle, and uh, beam collision spot is very small, 15 nanometers in, in design. Presently, it's 300 nanometers. Um, <clears throat> higher luminous, twice as high luminosity is observed compared to the previous KKB is twice as small beam current. So the nano beam scheme is working successfully. But we observed various problems in a, a machine. So we decided to have a 15 month shutdown starting now to replace many components of the accelerators. And we'll come back with higher luminosity of uh, two times 10 to 34 in October next year after careful machine tuning. Uh, this uh, compares uh, in the physics between uh, LHCB and uh, PL2. But these decay modes of uh, B, D, tau, and so on, uh, LHCB is just disadvantageous because of the large uh, product rate. But for the decay modes, including gammas and neutrinos in the final state, E plus E minus B factor is advantageous. So there will be an interesting competition between LHCB and uh, PL2 in the coming years in search for uh, effect of new physics in, uh, uh, in heavy flavor decay. Okay, let me move on to the International Linear Collider, ILC. <clears throat> the ILC is a plus minus linear collider based on superconducting RF technology, which has been developed by international high-energy physics community over many, many years. And the Japanese uh, scientific community and uh, KEK proposed to the J Japanese uh, government to host it in Japan in 12, I'm uh, sorry, 2012. This proposal was uh, uh, supported by previous European strategy, USP5 and so on. The overall length of this machine is 20 kilometers from here to there. And uh, uh, central mass energy is 250 GeV, which is optimized for Higgs particle production. So this ILC is a Higgs factory at its first stage. We have to have a, a field gradient of 31.5 uh, megavolt per meter field gradient to accelerate the beam up to 250 GeV with 20 kilometer. And the beam size has to be as small as 5.9 nanometers at the interaction point to achieve the luminosity of 1.8 times 10 to 34. Um, so international accelerator community together with KEK are now working on the development of uh, these two technologies, mainly nanobeam technology and superconducting RF technology. The promotion of the IRC is being done in Japan in the following organization. Um, <clears throat> 
since the RC is so big project that uh, efforts only by scientists is insufficient to push it forward. So we have a framework called five party meeting at the center of RSC promotion. The five parties include politicians or IRC Federation, members of IRC Federation of that members. Max is a government uh, that supports fundamental science in Japan. Physicists and the representatives from industrial sector and uh, candidate sites. They are uh, supporting this IRC promotion very strongly. And we are making productive discussions a possible solution to the problems to realize IRC by all the stakeholders. This is a central scheme of IRC promotion in Japan. On the other hand, in the uh, Felix uh, community, we have an organization called IRC Japan. Uh, the spokesperson is Shoji Asai, and we have an executive board, task forces, work, working groups. And this uh, IRC Japan is closely working with GIK to organize activities of the Japanese Philippine community to realize the RC. <coughs> so here's a uh, recent history in Japan. The IRC, uh, this if I established the new organization called IDT in August 2020 to realize the IRC in uh, stepwise. And uh, in June uh, 2021, last year, the IDT published a report on the overall design of the new next organization called Prelab and the 18 research, I mean, work packages to be implemented there. At the same time, the Japanese physics community submitted a report to next on the progress of the IRC over the past three years. So following these reports, next, the Japanese government set up an IRC advisory panel to evaluate these reports and publish the recommendation in February this year. And I picked up three key points from this uh, recommendation. The panel recognized that uh, academic significance of particle physics research and the uh, importance of research field and understand the value of uh, international collaborative research. However, the panel found that it is too premature, still premature to proceed into the IRC pre-love phase, which is coupled with the expression of interest to host the IRC. So in other words, uh, they concluded that uh, going into pre-love is a bit too mature because it's closely related to the approval of the entire IRC. The second point is that the uh, panel recommends that development of key technologies for the next generation accelerators such as IRC should continue by further strengthening international collaboration among the institute and laboratories. In other words, uh, pre-lab is a bit too early, but we can start some smaller scale international collaboration to uh, make a progress in the uh, IRC technologies and the working packages. The third point is that for realizing a very large project such as IRC, cultivating framework where the related countries can exchange information on the situations. And uh, this says that uh, this suggests Japanese government to have some of the chances to exchange ideas with other governments. So following these recommendations, uh, we <coughs> made some proposal to ICFA in March this year. And uh, this is a plan in the next years, a year or two, uh, based on the discussion at IFA. We have two things. One is to create a new international collaborative framework to implement the most urgent work packages. <clears throat> uh, we need uh, substantial money for this. We believe that it is highly likely that the budget for this will be approved in the Japanese government in uh, Japanese fiscal year 2023, which is a year starting April uh, next year. And detailed R&D plan is being elaborated in the uh, working group two of IDT, and I think it's quite in good shape. And we are about to start discussions with the related laboratories to exchange MOUs between interlaboratories. And the second point is that uh, IDT is going to start an international ex expert panel 
uh, to deepen discussion in two or three stages, and then hold meetings to explain the progress to the, to the representatives of the relevant governments. With this as a starting point, we will encourage intergovernmental discussions on the IOC. We hope that at least one meeting attended by the government officials held uh, by the end of this year. Um, so you, you may wonder when uh, CIRC is approved in the Japanese government. I have no clear answer to that question yet, unfortunately, but instead, let me show you this uh, long-term scenario. We finished this first IDD phase successfully, and we were hoping to jump to pre-lab phase immediately. And after four years in the pre-lab, we will go into the uh, IRC construction stage. That was what we uh, hoped before, but we uh, decided to insert, oops, sorry, insert this part, the second phase of IDD, and where we do joint R&D and international expert panel discussions. Then uh, pre-level phase will follow, but I think this pre-level phase is shorter than four years because uh, some of the important work packages are being done, will be done by this uh, second phase of this IET. Okay, this is a long-term scenario. <clears throat> so this is a summary of what I talked about and what I have not talked about. In fact, uh, we have a good uh, particle physics program at KEK and in Japan. We have a long baseline neutron experiment, clever physics program at J Park and a super uh, KKV. <clears throat> and we have many uh, scientists working at uh, Atlas when the KEK serves as a base for them. <clears throat> and uh, KEK is also working on the next step, immediate next step program. Upgrade of J Park main ring for Hypercandio Kande, contribution to a high limit NSC program at Atlas and Atlas upgrade. And Light World is a, a <coughs> satellite uh, uh, detector for B mode polarization of cosmic, ray, cosmic microwave background. And uh, we are committed to play a leading role in realizing the RC. So uh, I'd like to ask you. Uh, understanding and support. Thank you. So I completely failed in my mission to keep this uh, session on track. And uh, so I have been instructed uh, for, with a change of plan uh, that we will not have the panel of the lab directors. If you have questions, please enter them into the Google Doc and uh, the organizers will do the best they can to get the uh, answers to you. Um, I am being removed as session uh, chair and Tao Han is replacing me. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, we uh, just going to take a, a, a five minute break because the captioners are very tired from writing all of that and they need to rest, our, rest for five minutes. And so in five minutes, Tauhan will take over. Thank you. <laughs> 